Identity theft is the fastest growing crime in America. As an added bonus, Video Professor has included with your lessons the tools and information you need to protect you and your computer from identity theft and other online dangers. Before beginning your lessons, we recommend you clean your computer's files and arm it against these dangers. Located on each disk, you'll find a component of the Personal Internet Security Package. On disk 1, we've included a Video Professor Personal Firewall Program for you to try free, along with a tutorial to help use it most effectively. Without a firewall, your computer is open to hackers and identity thieves. On disk 2, we've included an identity theft protection lesson. This bonus tutorial gives you essential prevention information. Thorough lessons educate you on scams and show you how to guard your private information. Also, find out how to get up to $25,000 in personal protection. On disk 3, we've included three additional free resources. The Identity Theft Recovery Lesson, the Video Professor Virus Protection Program, and accompanying tutorial. With the Identity Theft Recovery Lesson, we'll show you how to repair damage as quickly as possible, tell you where to get help, and give you a list of resources. The Video Professor Virus Protection Program provides you with a critical defense against computer viruses. It destroys existing viruses and keeps out new ones. Take a few minutes now to install and get familiar with your free bonus personal internet security package. Welcome to Video Professor's Computer Learning Series. For the best possible learning experience, we recommend setting your screen to the highest available color quality. To change your display settings, please follow these easy steps. Click your right mouse button on an empty space on your desktop. Select Properties from the menu. When the Display Properties dialog box opens, select the Settings tab. Under Color Quality, select Highest 32-Bit. If 32-Bit is not an option on your computer, choose the highest level available. Here, you can also adjust your screen resolution, which determines the size of windows and icons on your screen, including the Lesson window. If you find that you have a problem seeing the lesson, you can return here and make the lesson window larger by clicking and dragging the resolution slider to the left. If you'd like to make the lesson window smaller so you can see more of the application you are learning about, click and drag the resolution slider to the right. When you are done altering your display settings, click Apply. If you are asked if you want to keep these settings, click Yes. Then click OK at the bottom of the Display Properties window. Your display settings are now changed. To start this or any other Video Professor lesson, put the CD in your CD-ROM drive. The CD should start playing automatically. If the CD is already in the drive, double-click the Video Professor Start CD icon on your desktop to begin the lesson. On our lesson menu, you will see several icons. By selecting Other Offers from Video Professor, you will see great deals on products other than our CD lessons. You must be connected to the internet to do this. These offers change frequently, so be sure to return regularly to see what's new. 
video professor is always updating its products to reflect the latest software releases. Therefore, this CD may contain more than one version of the lesson you ordered. Click the version checker icon to find out which software release you own and which lesson you should view. Select that lesson and you will see the table of contents where the lesson sections are listed and described. To view a section, click on it in the table of contents. Most sections build on information presented in the sections before them, so we suggest you start at the first menu item and work your way through to the last. We have packed this CD with information and sometimes move at a fast pace. To help you control your learning experience, we have designed the CD to work like a VCR, allowing you to pause, rewind, or fast forward the lesson. If you ever need to step away from your computer during the lesson, simply click the pause button. When you return, clicking the play button will resume the lesson right where you left off. Using the rewind and fast forward buttons, you can review material you've just seen or skip ahead to a later part of the lesson. No matter where you are in a section, clicking the main menu button will return you to the table of contents. To help you see where you are in a section, we have included a progress bar with percentage markers. Simply move your cursor over the bar to view these percentage markers and click on one to instantly move to that place in the movie. For example, if you close the lesson window after viewing 60% of a section, when you restart the lesson, just click 60% on the progress bar and the section will start playing right at 60%. Your lesson window plays on top of the application window, so you can follow along step by step. By clicking and dragging the lesson window's title bar, you can move the lesson anywhere on your screen. This way, you can access every part of the program that you are working in. At the end of each section, you have the option to test your understanding of the presented materials by taking the Video Professor Knowledge Quiz. The quiz will ask you multiple questions about the material you just viewed. Click one answer for each question, and when you're finished, we'll grade your quiz and let you know how you did. Then, you can view the correct answers, or, on more recent lessons, you can click the Review Answer in Lesson button to replay the relevant segment of the lesson movie. Thank you for learning with Video Professor. We hope you have a great learning experience. Welcome to my lesson on using the Internet. The Internet is a powerful tool used by people around the world. It conveniently links people from different places, allowing them to communicate and share information quickly and easily. It is used in homes, in business, education, government, and nonprofit organizations. Although no one knows exactly how many people use the Internet, it is estimated that there are now more than 600 million users worldwide, and that number is growing daily. In just a few short years, the Internet has become a part of our world. Like the automobile and the airplane, it is here to stay. In this lesson, we'll begin with a brief history of the Internet and how it works. By the time you complete this lesson, you'll know how to explore the Internet and use it to find specific information. You'll learn what a home page is and how you can personalize it to match your interests. You'll understand some of the most common Internet terminology, and you'll be able to use one of the most popular features of the Internet, email, to send, receive, save, and delete email. 
If you feel a little lost at first with all of these new terms and concepts, don't worry. We'll discuss them as we move along. By the time you've completed my lessons, you'll feel right at home as you explore the Internet. And remember, you can pause the lesson at any time and review previous sections before continuing. Before we continue, let's talk briefly about the skills and equipment you'll need for this lesson. We will be using Microsoft Windows as our operating system. I assume you already know the basic Windows conventions for accessing menus and for using your mouse and keyboard to select options within drop-down menus and dialog boxes. If not, I suggest you see my lessons on learning Windows before you begin. I also assume you have a computer with Internet access. Your computer should have a built-in modem that allows it to communicate through your phone line, or you could be connected to the Internet with a high-speed connection such as a DSL or cable modem access. A third method, wireless service, is a new emerging technology that allows communication using wireless laptop or desktop computers. Which method of accessing the Internet you choose depends on how you want to use the Internet and what you are willing to pay. Because the Internet is full of graphics that can be very large, the faster your modem connection, the faster your computer can download information. I will assume you are using at least a 56K modem for your Internet connection. If you are using your home phone line and it is not a dedicated telephone line for the Internet, Make sure nobody picks up another extension while your computer is using the line or your connection could be disrupted. Another factor that determines the speed of your Internet connection is the amount of RAM your computer has installed. We recommend at least 32 megabytes or meg of RAM for the average Internet user. However, 64 meg or greater of RAM can greatly speed up your Internet experience. The last thing you'll need for our lesson is an Internet Service Provider, also known as ISPs. These companies provide the service for connecting you to the Internet. You can't access the Internet without having an ISP. Since all ISPs have similar features and methods for accessing the Internet, this lesson will be useful no matter which ISP you use. Although your ISP may be different from the one we use during some parts of this lesson, once you've mastered one ISP, you'll feel right at home using any ISP. You can either follow along with us as we progress through the lesson, or you can just watch and use the skills you learn here with your own Internet service provider. I strongly recommend following along with us as we move forward, though, because practicing your new skills here will make them much easier to apply regardless of which ISP you use. For the rest of this lesson, make sure you have a phone line connected to your modem and no other programs open and running on your computer. Before we get started, I'd like to introduce my student assistant, Suzanne, who will be helping me through the lesson. Simply follow along with her, and you'll be using the Internet in no time at all. So let's get started exploring the Internet. We'll begin with a brief history. What exactly is the Internet? Simply defined, the Internet is a system of computers connected together allowing people from all over the world to view and share information. The Internet was designed by the government in the Cold War era as a method of keeping communication paths open in time of crisis. With these paths available through telephone systems, information could flow freely even if many traditional communication systems no longer worked. Today, the Internet connects hundreds of millions of individual users worldwide. What's most important about this huge network of computers is what it does. When our computer is connected to the Internet, we can view information and communicate with people residing in our own city, in another state, or in another country halfway around the world. Today, the Internet is used in ways few people anticipated when it was first developed. Information and goods are exchanged every second of the day. 
friends and relatives are communicating faster and more frequently than ever before. Business is conducted between people who've never met, and much of this business is being conducted through websites. A website is a collection of one or more files or pages residing on a computer. This computer is referred to as a server, and it can be located anywhere in the world as long as it has access to the Internet. Each website is owned and managed by a company, organization, or individual. A website where business is conducted is like an electronic storefront. Instead of going to a building to shop, we visit the store at our computer. Having a website is essential in today's corporate world. There are millions of websites on the Internet, and more are being added daily. Whether your business is small or large, people will look to the Internet to find your products and services. Whenever you're on the Internet, you'll have an address window displayed just below the web toolbar. Inside will be the address of the website you're currently at. Suzanne's window is displaying the Video Professor website address. This window displays the Uniform Resource Locator, or URL, of this site, also known as the web address. Each location we find on the web will have its own unique address. But behind the scenes, computers are talking to each other using IP addresses. An IP address is a unique address for each server on the Internet, just like your home address is unique for its location. A domain name locates the address of an organization or entity on the Internet. For example, the domain name www.nationalgeographic.com locates the homepage for National Geographic. It's easier to remember a domain name than a numeric IP address. Each domain name has three parts. The www in front of the name stands for World Wide Web. The word or phrase after the www is the unique name that identifies the organization. The .com extension at the end of the domain name reflects the purpose of the organization or entity. .com tells us this is a commercial website. There are many other extensions in use today, such as .edu for education websites and .org for nonprofit organizations. There are also country-specific extensions, such as .ca for Canada and .nz for New Zealand. That's a brief background on the Internet and the role it plays in our world today. Even if you've never used the Internet before now, chances are it has had an impact on your life. Now that we know where the Internet has come from, let's see where it can take us. If you haven't done so yet, log on to the Internet using your Internet service provider. At this time, you should be at the home page of that ISP. A home page is usually the first web page visitors see when they log on to a website. Although websites can have only one page or many pages, the home page is the starting point for the rest of the website. For this reason, it's also known as a start page. A website is actually a computer somewhere hosting the information for that website. These sites can be located anywhere in the world. Viewers, because we don't know which ISP you have, we will be demonstrating a good portion of our lesson using Yahoo, one of the most popular Internet services. Yahoo is easy to navigate around and anyone can access it. The features we'll use with Yahoo are similar to those found on the home pages of other major ISPs. So if you are following along, the skills you learn working with Yahoo can easily be applied to your own ISP. I encourage you to follow along on Yahoo with Suzanne, so we're all looking at the same screens with the same options. We'll begin at the home page of the Yahoo website. To get there, go to the address window toward the top of your screen. Click inside it and type the following web address www.yahoo.com Press the Enter key and the Yahoo homepage appears. Notice back in the address window there are now some additional characters HTTP, a colon, and two forward slash symbols. This tells us we're actually at that website. 
HTTP stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol. It's a set of rules for communicating and transferring files on the World Wide Web. The HTTP prefix is automatically added when we type an address in the window, so we never have to type it in when entering a website address. To navigate the Internet, you need a browser. A browser is the program that translates the programming language of the Internet into the words and graphics you see on a web page. Although most of their work is invisible to users, browsers are a necessary tool for using the World Wide Web. Some of the most common browsers are Microsoft's Internet Explorer, Netscape Navigator, and AOL. Microsoft provides Internet Explorer with all Windows software, so it's likely this will be your default browser. When you're on the Internet, the name of your current browser will be listed in the title bar at the top of your screen. Although many ISPs have a default browser, you can switch to another browser if you like by downloading the browser from that company's website. We'll discuss downloading programs on the Internet a little later. For our lesson, we will be using Internet Explorer. If you're using another browser, it will work pretty much the same. No matter which browser you're using, you'll learn how to use the Internet. Let's take some time to become familiar with the home page. Remember, the Internet is a dynamic, constantly changing world, and what you see on your screen may look different from Suzanne's screen. You should still be able to follow along without any problem, though. The Yahoo homepage is similar to the homepage of other popular ISPs. Each of these sites lets you check your email, search the Internet for information, go shopping online, read movie reviews, find tomorrow's weather forecast, read the latest news, and choose from dozens of other options. There is so much information available right at your fingertips that it's difficult to know where to begin. I should mention here that as we choose from these options, some of them may take time to download to your computer. Because we have a lot to cover in this lesson, we have edited out the time required to download a file. Remember, you can always pause or rewind the lesson at any time to allow you to follow along with each step. If you feel a website is taking too long to download, or you choose something by mistake, you can click the Stop button on the web toolbar to cancel that request. Suzanne's Stop button is the icon of a page with a red X on it. Yours may look slightly different. To find it, position your mouse pointer slowly over the button until the small pop-up sign labeled Stop appears. The Yahoo window layout has some elements common to all Windows-based programs, while others are specific to working on the Internet. Let's do a brief overview. I already mentioned the title bar at the top of the screen, which lists the website and browser we are currently in. Below that is the Internet Explorer menu bar. Clicking any of these words opens a drop-down menu with options for managing files, editing, viewing, accessing your favorite websites, tools, and getting help. Many of these options are familiar as Windows commands. We'll use the menu bar often as we progress through my lessons. We'll return to Internet Explorer later on and learn how to set options and preferences. Below the menu bar are the standard buttons on the web toolbar, providing quick access to some of the most frequently used commands. Many of these buttons, such as the back button, the forward button, and the stop button, allow us to navigate or surf the Internet by moving around between previously visited sites. We'll look briefly at some of these options now and return later to see more of how they work. The Refresh button updates our screen to make sure we have the latest version of the current web page. The Home button returns us to our home page no matter where we are on the Internet. The Search button opens a box on the left side of the screen where we can type in questions and Internet Explorer will search the Internet for answers. We'll spend time searching the Internet later in my lesson, so if you've opened the search pane, click the X in the upper right corner to close it. Favorites lets us quickly open our favorite websites without having to type the addresses. The Media button allows us to play music, video, or multimedia files, or even listen to Internet radio stations. Clicking the History button opens a pane listing recently visited websites. The Mail button takes us to our email account. Print lets us print items from the Internet.
The remaining buttons may react and look slightly different than Suzanne's depending on which programs you have installed and how your computer is set up. If you want more room for your web page display, it's easy to hide all these buttons. Right click anywhere on the web toolbar, and from the drop down menu, click on Standard Buttons. The entire row of buttons disappears and our home page moves up to fill in the blank. To display the buttons again, just right click anywhere on the Internet Explorer menu bar and click Standard Buttons again to bring them back on the page. Below the web toolbar is the address bar, which tells us we're at yahoo.com. Beneath the address bar is the actual start of the Yahoo homepage. On each side of the Yahoo heading are navigational links that quickly take us to other Yahoo pages. A link, which is short for a hyperlink, is a word or phrase that's electronically linked to another location on the Internet. Hyperlinks are often underlined or displayed in a different color. Clicking the link takes you to that location. Following various hyperlinks to see what information we can find is commonly known as surfing the web. We'll look briefly at these links and return to explore some of them a little later. The first button on the left, Personalize, lets us create a customized home page based on our interests and preferences. The Finance button gives us access to all the latest financial news along with tools for managing your money, researching mutual funds, paying bills online, and other personal finance topics. There's more information here than we can cover in this lesson. So if one of these subjects interests you, I suggest returning here to explore on your own. Next is the Shop button. This button offers access to literally millions of products from thousands of stores, letting you browse and compare price before buying. We'll cover buying on the Internet in depth later on. The Mail button lets us set up and log on to a personal Yahoo email account. The next button, Messenger, is for instant messaging. Instant messaging allows us to communicate online with others without using email. It's a fun feature that lets you send messages to others logged on to the Internet. The drawback is that anyone you send a message to must also have Messenger installed. The last button, Hot Jobs, offers a job search feature so you can look for employment opportunities around the country. Some of these features require you to have a Yahoo ID account, which we'll sign up for a little later. To the right of Hot Jobs is the Help link. Click it. We can use this screen to type questions about Yahoo or select from a list of topics to learn more about specific features. Click the Back button, and we're returned to the home page. The Back button always takes us to the page we were at previous to the current one. If we kept clicking the Back button, it would continue to step us back through the pages we visited since signing on to the Internet. Under the Yahoo heading area is the Yahoo search field. Just like with the Internet Explorer search pane we saw a while ago, we can type keywords here on just about any subject imaginable and get results almost instantly. We'll get plenty of experience with Internet searches later in this lesson. Below Yahoo Search, the page is divided into two columns. On the left, you begin to see the power of the World Wide Web. These categories can take us to a variety of topics with just a mouse click. The underlined and colored words are the hyperlinks. As I mentioned earlier, clicking these words instantly takes us to other pages or websites on the Internet. And we've already seen that clicking the Back button takes us from the new page back to the previous one. In this section, we can shop for cars, get a map, organize a calendar, read a movie review, research health-related issues, or look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Although a few of these links require a Yahoo account, most do not, and clicking them takes us right to that page. With so many possibilities, we could spend all day browsing these links. I suggest you come back on your own and explore the ones that interest you. Next is a link where you can make Yahoo your homepage. We're going to do that for this lesson, so we'll all be looking at the same screens as we move forward. You can change it back at any time. Click that link, and a box opens asking if we would like to change our homepage to Yahoo. Click Yes.
Yahoo is now our default homepage every time we log on to the internet, regardless of which ISP we have. Before we continue, I'll show you how you can set your homepage back. Go to the menu bar at the top of the screen and click Tools to open the drop down menu. Click the last item in the list, Internet Options. The Internet Options box should open to the General tab. In the top section labeled Home Page, the Address field should already be selected. Delete it and type in the address of the website page you want for your home page. You don't have to type in the HTTP, colon, or forward slashes, just the address beginning with www. At this point, if we wanted to make a change, we would click the Apply button at the bottom of the box and click OK to return to the page we just left. Clicking the Home button on the web toolbar would then take us right to our new home page. Since we're keeping Yahoo as our home page for now, click Cancel. Moving down the page, you may see an advertisement or a feature story under the links. Since ISP home pages change daily, your Yahoo page will look different than Suzanne's. Next is a set of links for Yahoo services, such as website hosting and selling things online. Beneath the services section is Yahoo's website directory, arranged alphabetically by subject. Let's look at one of them. Click Health. And we get a page listing dozens of health-related categories. The number next to each one indicates how many subcategories there are under that topic. Click the First Aid link. In the Category section, we have even more topics to help us narrow down our search even more, such as CPR or the Heimlich Maneuver. The Site Listings section are actual articles on a variety of first aid related subjects. To the right is Sponsor Results, which is reserved for businesses who pay to list their products or services related to the search. In the Site Listings section, find a link that sounds interesting, click it, and we're taken to a website or article on first aid. You may notice, as we move around the Internet, the address bar displayed a new address for each location. Often, when we're looking for information on the Internet, we need to click from link to link to get to our final results. But with so much data available at our fingertips, the effort is well worth our time. And compared to the time spent leafing through stacks of books or magazines, it's a pretty quick search. Let's return to the home page. We have two ways to get there. We can either click the Home Page button, or we can use the Back button to click back through the pages we've visited until we've returned to the Home Page. Now that you've seen what's here, you can come back anytime and look around. Scroll down to the bottom of the Home Page. Here is a list of Yahoo sites for foreign countries, as well as for several U.S. cities. The More Yahoo section has even more links to various subjects, services, and features. At the bottom of the screen is another search field and links to Yahoo information. Scroll back up to the top. The top of the right-hand column will probably contain some advertisements. Below that, depending on the setup of the Yahoo page, are boxes containing the day's top stories, some online shopping links, and the latest gossip from the entertainment world. You can see a home page is just the starting place for thousands of other destinations on the Internet. As we spend more time exploring, you'll become faster and more efficient in your travels around the World Wide Web. We've taken a good look at the Yahoo homepage, but we're not limited to working with this page layout every time we come here. Many ISPs allow users to set up their own homepage so it displays the topics and features that match their personal interest, and Yahoo is no exception. In the next section, we'll learn how to customize our homepage.
The home pages of internet service providers are designed to give customers the best the internet has to offer. From shopping and news to education and entertainment, there are millions of internet sites available at our fingertips. In my last section, we explored the Yahoo homepage and looked at some of the categories and links. Let's dig a little deeper and learn how we can customize the homepage to match our preferences. Although we'll use Yahoo for this lesson, most ISPs will allow you to personalize their homepage. If you use another ISP, I suggest following along with us for now using Yahoo and applying those skills to your homepage later on. I mentioned earlier we would be setting up our own Yahoo account in order to access certain features of Yahoo. Personalizing our homepage is one of those features. Let's do that now. In the top left corner of the Yahoo window, click the Personalize button. It has the word My on it. The My Yahoo page is where we choose the options to customize our homepage. But before we can do any work, we need to set up an account so we can sign in. Find the sign in link at the top left corner of the page and click it. It's under the Welcome to My Yahoo greeting. Here's the sign in page. Since we don't have an ID, we won't be able to sign on yet. Under the heading New to Yahoo, find the Sign Up Now link and click it. This is the sign up page for new accounts. Each field must be filled out before we can get a Yahoo account. The first section is for entering your first and last name. Go ahead and fill in those fields. The next section is for choosing an ID and password. In the first field, choose an ID, which will be your login name. Since Yahoo, like other ISPs, has many users, most of the common ID names have already been chosen. This is where you can be creative with selecting a name. You may want to use a combination of your name, initials, and numbers, or a name having to do with your hobby or personal interest. Don't worry about using upper or lower case for your ID, since Yahoo treats them both the same. Suzanne will try the name Suzanne S. The link next to the ID field, check to see if this ID is available, lets us see in advance whether our ID is already in use. We'll check during the submission process, so move to the next field. Next is the password, which must be at least six characters long. I suggest using a combination of letters and numbers to make it harder for someone else to enter your account without your knowledge. For your password, capitalization does matter, so using upper and lowercase letters is another way to make your password more secure. Retype the password in the third field. Checking the next box allows us to create an email address for this account. Let's go ahead and activate our Yahoo email address in case we want to use it later. Our ID and password will then be the same for email as for other Yahoo services. Make sure this box is checked. The following section helps Yahoo to verify your identity. You'll be asked these questions if you forget your password or if you need help with your account. Click the down arrow next to the security question field and select a question to answer. Next, type your answer to the question. It should be one you can remember, but that others won't easily guess. Move to the next field and enter your birthday. The last field here is for an alternate email address. If you already have an email account, enter the address here. Yahoo will use it to send account notices and information such as new password requests. If you don't enter an email address, Yahoo will use your new Yahoo email address to send email regarding your account with them. The next section gives Yahoo some basic information about yourself so they can provide relevant content. Beginning at the first field, enter your preferred language for website content. Zip code and gender. In the industry field, click the down arrow and from the menu select your area of employment. In the title field, choose a job title 
And in the next box, select a specialization. Depending on the title you choose, this field may or may not be available. Below this field is a section of checkboxes where you can ask to be sent offers and promotions on a variety of subjects. Unless you want advertising email in your inbox, I suggest you uncheck all boxes here, including the top checkbox that begins with Send Me Special Offers. The last section asks you to verify this is not an automated registration by typing the code shown in the box into the empty field. Go ahead and do that now. And when you're done, click the button labeled Submit This Form. It looks like someone has already taken the name Suzanne S., so we need to try a different one. Suzanne, in the field labeled Yahoo ID, try a new username. Yahoo may ask you to enter another code here. If it does, type in the new code. And when you're done, click the Submit This Form button again. It looks like that was a good name choice. Registration is complete, and we now have a new Yahoo account. If you left any fields blank or entered information incorrectly, Yahoo will let you know and have you resubmit the form. Before you go any further, be sure to write down your ID and password and keep it in a secure place. Make sure the checkbox for installing the Yahoo Companion Toolbar is not checked and click the Continue to Yahoo button. After a brief pause, our new personal page opens with our name displayed at the top of the screen. At the top of the window are four buttons for customizing the page. Two of them affect how the screen will look and the other two determine the content. Click the first one, Change Colors. This page offers background themes for your home page. The theme directory on the left side contains dozens of choices, as well as a colors only option for changing layout colors. Click it. Yahoo offers quite a few color combinations for changing the look of your page. Scroll down to see some of them. Let's try the Sahara theme. Viewers, click the Use This Theme button next to the one that you like and we're taken back to our home page with a new color scheme applied. Click the Change Colors button to return to that page. Find the Holiday category from the theme directory and click it. Here are some themes based on holidays. Again, clicking Use This Theme would apply the new theme to your My Yahoo page. Click the Choose Content button at the top of the window. This section lets us choose up to 20 different content subjects for our page. We can also personalize the name of our page using the Page Name field. Click three times in the field to highlight it and type in a new name for your page. It will appear at the top of the page when we're finished. Suzanne, let's name your page Suzanne's Yahoo. Scroll down the page and you'll see numerous topics available for displaying on Yahoo's homepage. A W next to the topic means it will display as a wide module on your screen, while an N means it will be a narrow module. Click a checkbox to add a topic you'd like to see on your My Yahoo screen. And uncheck any you'd like to remove. Remember, there's a maximum number of 20. Suzanne's choices reflect her interest in news headlines, the stock market, health issues, animals, and music. Make sure you click the box next to TV listings under the entertainment section. We'll be working with it a little later. Click finished when you are through making your selections and click the change layout button. This page lets us determine where our different modules appear on the page. The selections from the choose content area are listed here and the personalized name we chose a moment ago now appears above our column. 
A button toward the bottom left corner of the page lets us select a two or three column layout. The default is two columns, so we'll leave it. We have a narrow column and a wide column for our page, and we can switch the position on the page by clicking either of the two Move Column buttons below the columns. Health is pretty important to Suzanne, so she's going to move it up so it appears at the top of her page. In the wide column, click to select Health Features and use the up arrow key to the right of the window to move it up under Headlines. Now go to the narrow column and move Message Center down to the bottom of the list. Viewers, if you've chosen content modules different from Suzanne's, rearrange them in whichever order you like. If there is any content you decide you don't want on your page, just highlight it and click the X to the right of the window to delete the selected content. When you're done arranging the modules, click Finished at the top of the page. Now click the button Add Delete Pages. Here we can expand My Yahoo by adding a new Yahoo page or creating a custom page. On the left side of the screen, Page Settings lets us adjust the greeting, the page refresh rate, and the default page. We'll leave these settings as they are. In the middle of the page, we can choose from some of Yahoo's preset pages created around subjects such as your finances, technology, or sports. If one of these looks interesting, click the radio button to select it. Suzanne will choose the health and fitness page. Move to the selection labeled Build My Own Page and click Make My Own. This page will look familiar since it's the same one we used when we chose our content. But instead of adding to our home page, here we can name and build a second page using up to 20 of these content modules. The home page and the health and fitness page are enough for Suzanne, so click the back button to return to the previous page. If you'd like to create a page, feel free to pause the lesson here and do so. From the personalized page, click the finish button. And we're back at our My Home page. It certainly looks different from when we last left it. The Health Features section is now toward the top. The Message Center is at the bottom. And the color scheme has changed. Also, some of the Yahoo sections, such as Services, have moved. And the Shopping section at the top is gone. The bar containing the customizing buttons now has tabs for creating new pages, and Suzanne's health and fitness page. Clicking one of the tabs will open that page. If we do create new pages and name them, we can open them from here. The changes we just made aren't permanent. We can go back anytime and redesign the My Yahoo page. We can also customize our home page to make it even more personal. Scroll down the page and you'll notice that many of our content sections have a small button in the title bar labeled Edit. Whenever this button appears, we can change that section to match our personal preferences. Let's try one of them. Scroll down to the TV Listings section and click the Edit button. Here we can choose which TV listings will display on our personal homepage. Our choices include cable, local, satellite, and time zone. The Edit Location button above the listings choices lets us specify a zip code. To change the zip code, just click the button, enter your zip code, and click the Go button to return to the TV listings page. Suzanne, let's choose your local cable company. In the Cable Listings section, click the down arrow to the right of the Cable Provider field, Select Comcast Denver, Colorado from the drop down menu. Viewers, if you'd like to, go ahead and choose an option that matches your own TV preferences and click the Go button. 
This is the edit page, where we choose which channels we want to display. Under step 2 is a list of available channels. Suzanne, choose the ones you want listed on your home page by clicking and highlighting them from the available channels list and clicking the add button to move them to your choices list. Yahoo lets you add up to 60 channels. You probably don't want too long a list on your home page, so I recommend limiting the number to just your favorites. You can save time by holding down the control key as you click to highlight your channel choices. When you've made your selections, click the add button once and all your channels will move to your choices column. Pause the lesson here if you need a minute to add your selections. If you'd like to take any channel off the new list, just click to highlight that channel and click the Remove button to move it back to the available channels list. Step 3 lets us choose the number of channels we want to display on our page. We could choose the first 15, 30, or 45 channels from our cable channel, but we're going to display our favorites instead. Click the radio button next to the last option, All Favorite Channels. In step 4, we need to choose a start time for our listings. 8 p.m. is fine, so let's leave it there. We're done, so click the Finish button. And we return to our My Home page. Scroll down to the TV listing section. And there's our personalized television schedule for tonight. We can change this listing anytime by clicking the Edit button and selecting Other Listing Options. Now that you know how to edit your TV listings, feel free to come back on your own and customize some of the other sections of your personal homepage. Before we move on, I'd like to show you two more features here. Scroll back to the top of the page. To the right of the four customized buttons we've been working with are two options. Clicking the first one, Make This My Homepage, would change your default homepage from Yahoo's homepage to the page you just created. For our lesson, we'll leave Yahoo's page as the homepage. You can come back later if you like and change the homepage to your new My Yahoo page. Let's return to Yahoo's homepage. Click the Yahoo link toward the upper right side of the window. It's next to the Help button. We're still signed in, but now we're back at the Yahoo homepage. We can return to our personal page from here just by clicking the My Yahoo button in the top left corner. For now, we'll log out of My Yahoo, so find the Sign Out button to the right of the Yahoo search field and click it. It's now the Sign In button. Whenever you want to return to your My Yahoo page, you'll sign in from the Yahoo homepage using either the My button in the upper left corner or the Sign In button. No matter which ISP you use, the sign in and sign out process will be similar. Now that we've learned how to create a personalized page, let's take a closer look at using the Internet. One of the most powerful features of the Internet is the search engine. Search engines are programs that allow us to quickly find information on just about any subject imaginable, and there are a number of search engines available on the World Wide Web. Most ISPs have their own search engines right on the home page. There are also a number of independent search engines with their own home pages, such as AltaVista, Ask Jeeves, Lycos, and Hotbot. We'll begin exploring the Internet by using one of the most popular search engines, Google. From your home page, click in the address bar, type www.google.com, and we're instantly taken to the Google home page. Under the Google title are buttons for doing different types of searches. We can search the entire web, look for images, post and read comments on thousands of discussion groups or forums, search among news items, or go to Google's shopping page called Frugal. For general searches, the web category is probably the best choice. Web is the default category whenever you go to Google, so it should already be selected. 
The blank field beneath the buttons is the search field, where we want to enter the keywords for our search. Keywords are the words we type in that tell the search engine what information to look for. Let's do a query and see what we find. Say we want to find some pictures taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. We'll start by searching and typing telescope in the box and clicking the Google search button. Or you can just press the enter button. The Google search engine now begins looking through the entire web for pages dealing with telescopes. It doesn't take long before the search is complete. Here are the results of our search. In a matter of seconds, Google browsed the internet looking for matches to our query and reported back its findings. This page displays the first 10 or so telescope-related websites. In Suzanne's search, Google found over 3 million pages containing the word telescope. That's a lot more than she needs, but it demonstrates the power of a search engine. Scroll down through the page and look at some of the website results Google thinks best fits our search criteria. The titles at the top of each website section are hyperlinks with short descriptions of the websites themselves. As I mentioned earlier, hyperlinks, also known as links, are words or phrases electronically linked to another location on the Internet. Below each description is the web address for that site. Scroll down to the bottom of the list of sites and click Next. Here are the next 10 results of the search. We could keep looking through the results by clicking Next, but browsing through hundreds of pages to find what we want is not very productive. We need to be more specific with our search request to see if we can narrow down the results. Go back to the search field and type Hubble and press the Enter key. Well, that helped a little but the search engine still returned well over a million websites for our new search. Suzanne, scroll down until you see the link titled The Best of HST. Once you find it, click the hyperlink. This site contains some of the best images from the Hubble telescope. Click any of the links in one of the columns. After a short download, we get a great picture taken from the Hubble telescope. If we're looking for specific pictures, we could narrow the search again by entering the name of a specific galaxy. Or we could use another feature of Google that makes it such a helpful search engine. Let's try that. Click the Back button. We're taken back to the list of Hubble images. Click the Back button two more times. And we're back at the Google homepage. At the top of the screen, click the second tab labeled Images. This causes the search engine to search only for images based on our search words Telescope and Hubble. Instead of receiving a list of links and text, this time we receive 20 images with the name Hubble in them. This is a great tool to find images of specific items. We've seen a number of ways to search for information and images on the home page. And trying different search engines while using the same keywords can often give different results. But no matter which search engine you use, your results will depend on how specific you are when entering keywords. For example, typing in the word Hawaii will give you much more general search results than entering the words hula lessons in Hawaii. If Suzanne's retriever needs a bath, she might try Dog Grooming Denver. Google provides a tool for helping with even more specific searches. Click the Advanced Search link to the right of the Search button. The Advanced Search page lets us narrow down our search by telling Google to look for results containing all of the words listed here, an exact phrase, at least one of the words listed, or without one or more of the words listed in the field. This reduces the number of results in our search, saving us time and bringing us more relevant information. As you try different search engines, use words that describe what you are looking for. Three or four keywords will narrow your search, save you time, and make you a more efficient web surfer.
Now that you're more familiar with browsing the internet, feel free to return and spend some time researching your favorite subjects. Let's go to a website with something for everyone. Click in the address window and type www.weather.com. This is the website for the Weather Channel. It's a great place for finding current weather conditions and forecasts around the world. Click in the field labeled Enter City or U.S. Zip. Type Dallas. And click the Go button. Apparently, there's more than one city named Dallas. The first one is Dallas, Texas. Underneath the city name, we can choose from a number of weather reports. Click the first option on the left, Current. And we get current information on the weather in Dallas. There's even a way to tellweather.com to remember your location, so you get your local weather whenever you come here. On the weather.com navigation bar, just below the web address bar, click the button labeled My Page. You'll find it on the left side. This Preferences page lets us set up a personalized weather page. Beginning at the top section and working down the page, enter your zip code or city name, and check the local resources you'd like to see. Click Continue when you've made your selections. That's all there is to it. Here's our weather page, complete with a local forecast and the preferences we selected. From now on, to get to your personal weather page from your computer, just go to weather.com and click the My Page button. However, this method will work only when you're logged on using your own ISP account, because weather.com has recorded your preferences using something called cookies. I'll talk more about cookies and how they work a little later. Our personal weather site can be pretty handy for planning vacations, business trips, or what to wear for work tomorrow. This is definitely a website worth coming back to. In the process of exploring the Internet, you'll discover websites you want to return to time after time. One way to get there is to type the site address in the address bar, but there's a much quicker way. Let's add our personal weather page to our favorites list. Click the Favorites button on the web toolbar. A column appears on the left side of the screen. This is a list of favorite websites. Viewers, your list may differ from Suzanne's list. Click the Add button at the top of the list to open the Add Favorite box. The Name field lets us change the name of this web page to something more recognizable. Highlight the name in the field and type Weather. Click OK. The Add Favorite dialog box closes. And the Weather link with our name change is now added to our Favorites list. The next time we want to check the weather in our area, all we need to do is click the Favorites menu to open our Favorites list and click Weather. Marking a site as Favorite is also referred to as bookmarking, the process of adding a bookmark so we can easily return to the site. Click the Home button to return to the home page. And click the X at the top of the Favorites box to close it. Another way to access your Favorites list is to click the Favorites menu on the menu bar. This brings up the same list as the one we saw in the Favorites column a moment ago. So far, we've explored different ways to find information on the Internet and personalized our weather site. But how do you locate specific text once you're at a web page? Let's start with a new website. Suzanne is planning a vacation to Hawaii, and she'd like to get some tips on safety while she's in the islands. Go to the address window and type www.gohawaii.com. Here's the homepage of a website that helps visitors plan trips to Hawaii. In the column on the left, find the Travel Tips link and click it. There's a lot of text here, and we could read the entire page in hopes of finding safety information, but there's a quicker way to search a web page for specific words. Press your Control and F keys. 
The Find dialog box opens. This field lets us enter a word or a set of words we want to find on the current page. We can specify a search matching the whole word and matching the case. The radio buttons under the direction label let us search up or down the page depending on where the cursor is. Make sure the down button is selected. Let's see if there's anything about safety on this page. In the Find What box, type Safety. Click Find Next. And there's the word Safety highlighted at the bottom of the page. Click Find Next. And a second occurrence of the word appears in the body of the section on Safety in Hawaii. This feature is especially useful when you're trying to find specific words or references in a large document. Click the X to close the box. Before we move on, I want to show you two easy navigation tools that will save time when surfing the Internet. Click the down arrow to the right of the address bar. Here is a list of sites we've visited recently. You can scroll down with your mouse and click any of them to return to that site. Click outside the list to close it. Click the History button on the Web Toolbar. It's just to the right of the Media button. The History pane opens on the left side of the screen. This list displays links for websites and pages that we've recently visited. Clicking one of these links takes us back to that location. Close the pane by clicking the History button again. We'll end our session by returning to our home page. Click the Home button. And we're taken back to our home page, ready for our next step in learning the Internet. Email stands for electronic mail, and it's how we send messages as well as computer files over the Internet. Email is similar to regular post office mail, except it is much faster because it travels through computer and telephone lines. You can send email to anyone in the world who has an email account. Most ISPs offer email services where you can choose a login name and password, establish an account, and send and receive email. Most ISPs include email accounts as part of their paid subscription. When you signed up with your ISP, you probably received your own email account and chose your personal login name and password. For this lesson, we're going to use Microsoft's Outlook Express to learn about email. Outlook Express is one of the most popular email programs in use today. It comes free with Internet Explorer, providing an easy way to send, receive, and organize email. And since it's used by so many people in business and for personal use, Outlook Express is a great program to become familiar with. Since Internet Explorer comes pre-installed on most Windows systems, it's likely you already have Outlook Express on your computer. If you are using your own email service with Internet Explorer, you can open Outlook Express and follow along with Suzanne. And if you're using a browser other than Internet Explorer, you can still follow along with my lesson. Your email service will be similar, and you should be able to do many, if not all, of the things we cover here. Either way, we will be covering email fundamentals that apply to all programs. After we open Outlook Express, the layout and features should be similar to your own email program. If you have an email account or Outlook Express is already set up on your computer, just watch while we set up the program. When we get to the main screen, you can join us and follow along using either your own email service or Outlook Express. We'll start by opening Outlook Express. You can launch it either by opening your Start menu and finding it under All Programs, or if the Outlook Express icon is on your desktop, double-clicking it from there. You will get a message asking if you want to make this mailbox your default. Click No. If this is the first time you've opened Outlook Express on your computer, an Internet Connection window opens at this point. 
asking for your name. If you've used Outlook Express at your computer previously, you won't see the window, and the program will automatically open. Just sit back and watch the next few steps until we get to the main screen. If you don't currently use it, though, and you want to set up an account, I'll briefly go through the steps for doing this. Enter your name in the Display Name field and press Next. The email address box appears. In the blank field, enter the account name you received when you signed up with your ISP. Suzanne has an account with Video Professor, so she will enter this account name. This will allow her to use Outlook Express to read, send, and manage her Video Professor email. Press Next. Your ISP will give you instructions on how to complete the fields here as the information will be different from Suzanne's. Suzanne will use the information given to her by her ISP. Pause the lesson here if you need more time. When you are finished, click Next. This is the Internet Mail Login box. In the Account Name field, enter the account name provided by your ISP. Type your email password in the Next field. Unless you want to be automatically logged in each time you come here, I suggest making sure the checkbox next to Remember Password is clicked off. This prevents others from accessing your account without your knowledge. Click Next. A congratulations box appears. Click Finish. An Outlook Express box opens, asking if we would like to download folders. Click No. Now, maximize the Outlook window if necessary. And here we are at the Outlook Express main screen. At the top are the menu bar and email toolbars. The most frequently used icons are listed here. The area along the upper left side of the window is the folders view. There are several folders listed such as our inbox, our sent items folder, and the deleted items folder. The first folder labeled Outlook Express should be selected. If it's not, click to highlight it. This opens the Outlook Express pane on the right side of the screen. The folders view helps us keep email stored and organized. Directly below is the contacts view. This displays the names stored in our email address book. Look up on the icon bar and find the button titled Addresses. We'll come back here a little later and learn more about storing names and email addresses. On the right side is the Outlook Express pane. This area gives us easy access to tasks such as reading new email, creating a new email message, setting up a news group account, or working with our contacts. On the right side of the pane is a tip of the day, with arrows at the bottom for scrolling through additional tips. Suzanne, let's start by creating a new folder in the folder view so we can organize and store some video professor email. Click Local Folders. This view displays our folders, and from here we can easily add folders. Click File on the main menu toolbar. The first option on the drop down menu is New. You'll see an arrow pointing to the right, which indicates a sub menu of options is available. Hold your cursor over New, and the submenu opens. Select the Folder option, and click it. We now have a window titled Create Folder. Type Personal as the folder name, and click the OK button. Look back at our list in the Folders column, and there is the new Personal folder. We can use this tool anytime to create folders for organizing and storing emails from family, business, or other useful categories. We'll come back a little later to work with this folder. Let's look at addresses. Click the addresses icon located on the email toolbar, and the address book window opens. The address book is a convenient place to store names and email addresses. Since Suzanne is new to email, her address book is empty. Video Professor has set up a special greeting for all first time email users, but to receive it, we must first send Video Professor an email. Click the New button to open the pull down menu and select New Contact. 
The new Contacts Properties box is where we add a contact to our address book. At the top of the page, you'll see tabs opening pages for other categories such as Home, Business, and Personal. For now, we'll add information only in the Name page. The names we enter in the first name and last name fields will be the name displayed in the address field of our outgoing email message. With our cursor in the first name field, type in video. Notice as we type, the letters also appear in the display field. Press the tab key to get to the last name field and type in professor in the last name field. Again, the last name appears in the display name field. Click in the Email Addresses box. This is where we enter the email address of the person or organization. In regular postal mail, for the letter to reach the desired location, we write the address on the envelope using the person's name, street address, city, state, and zip code. An email address performs a similar task. It includes the address information needed to route a message from the computer, along the phone connections, through several other computer servers, and finally to someone else's computer. In the email window, type in the Video Professor email address, which is hello at videoprofessor.net. An email address is comprised of three parts. The username, in this case hello, followed by the at sign, which is the shift key and the number two key. And the location address of the provider service, which is videoprofessor.net. When finished typing in the address, click the OK button. The window closes and we return to the address book main page. Video Professor is now under the name heading and hello at videoprofessor.net under the email address heading. Double click Video Professor in the address list. The summary tab page opens with the same tabs we saw earlier. Click the name tab. And here's the information we just entered. We can come here anytime to edit or add information to this contact. Click Cancel and click the X on the address book page to close it as well. Now that we have entered the Video Professor email address in the address book, it will be available whenever we want to write a new mail message. Let's do that now. Click the Create Mail button on the email toolbar. A new email message box opens. Click to maximize the box to full screen if necessary. The To field is where we enter the destination address of our email. There's more than one way to place the address in the To field. If the address is already in our address book, simply start typing the name of the person in the To field, and Outlook Express will automatically put the address in for us. If you want to send email to a new contact that isn't in your address book, just type the email address for that contact in the To field. We will add that contact to the address book in a minute. Another way to select a name is by clicking the To button next to the blank field. This opens the Select Recipients box, where you can choose from the contacts in your address book. Select the Video Professor name in the address book, and click the To button to move the name into the To field. Under the To field is the CC field, which means carbon copy. This field sends a copy to anyone we think should see the email. Under the CC field is the BCC field. BCC stands for Blind Carbon Copy, which means recipients in the To and CC fields won't see anyone in the BCC field. And while recipients in the BCC field will see the addresses in the To and CC fields, they won't see other BCC addresses. We can easily enter multiple email addresses in the two CC and BCC fields. They just need to be separated by a semicolon or comma. Let's send a copy of this email to ourselves. Right now, your address is not in the list, so we will need to create it. Click OK. And we're back at our new message box. The BCC field isn't currently showing here, but it's easy to display. Open the View menu and select All Headers. 
the BCC field now appears. Viewers, put your full email address in the CC field so you can get a copy of this email. Next, we need a subject. When email shows up in our inbox, we see who sent it and the subject name they've given it. When we start receiving lots of messages, this helps sort through the stack of mail. For business and professional correspondence, I recommend using accurate descriptions in your subject line so the person receiving your email knows what to expect. Click in the subject field and type my first email. Press the tab key to move the cursor into the body of the email message. We'll make this short. Type in, hello professor, I am sending you my first email letter, just as you see it on the screen. We're intentionally misspelling the word sending so we can see the spell check feature in action. Click the spelling icon on the email toolbar. When the spell checker finds a spelling error, it opens a window with possible solutions to the misspelled word. It found sending misspelled and gave us a list of suggestions for our misspelled word. Click the correct one, sending, and click change. This automatically corrects the word in our email. We get a message saying the spelling check is complete, so click OK. We are ready to send the email. Click the Send button on the toolbar. Congratulations! Our email is on the way. That's all there is to it. Your email has been sent to Video Professor and to you. And we are back at Local Folders. Let's look at some of the other features on the main email page. Click the Inbox on the Folders list. The Inbox is where all the incoming emails are stored until they are moved to a different folder or deleted. Even if we read an email and closed it, it remains in our Inbox until we move or delete it. As you accumulate email messages over time, you will want to move or delete some of them as the Inbox can get full very fast. To delete an email from your Inbox, click the email to highlight it and press the Delete key. This sends it to the Deleted Items folder. You'll probably want to review and delete items from here fairly often, so you don't take up valuable hard drive space. You can always restore messages from the deleted folder and return them to your inbox. Just click the message you want to restore, and while holding the mouse button down, drag it toward the Inbox folder in the Folder List column. As soon as the inbox becomes highlighted, release the button and the email automatically drops into the inbox. The outbox temporarily holds our email messages until they are completely sent. Big files can sometimes take a while to leave the outbox, so don't exit Outlook until the message is sent. The Sent Items folder keeps a copy of the emails we sent out until we delete it or move it to another folder. You'll probably want to delete sent items from time to time as well unless you need to keep a record of them. The Drafts folder is where unfinished email messages are stored until they're ready to send. If you're in the middle of composing an email and you need to leave it until later, just close the email box using the X at the upper right corner. You'll get a message asking if you want to save changes to your email. Clicking Yes puts the email into the Drafts folder. You can return to it later by opening Drafts, and clicking the email to continue working on it. Finally, we have our newly created personal folder to store our personal mail. Let's see if our email greeting has come back from Video Professor. If you're following along with me, the time it takes for your mail to arrive will vary, but it should not take more than 10 minutes. We can speed up the process by clicking on the Send Receive button on the toolbar. It looks for any new messages we may have received. Look at the Inbox folder. It has a number next to it indicating how many new messages we have. Click the Inbox folder if it is not already selected. We see both emails are located here, the greeting from Video Professor, as well as the carbon copy you sent to yourself. If this is the first time you've opened this folder, you may also see some email messages from Microsoft Outlook Express. Be sure the Video Professor response is highlighted. The email is displayed in the preview pane, which is just below the inbox listing our messages. This pane lets us see the email without increasing it to full screen size. We don't see all the details that we would if we opened the email. 
but it's a quick way to scan the contents of the message. The paperclip icon to the left of the hello message in the upper window indicates this email has a file attached to it. This file is referred to as an attachment. Whenever we send email, we can attach files containing text documents, photos, spreadsheets, graphic images, and other file types. These attachments are an efficient way to send additional information with our emails. I'll talk more about them in a moment. The text of the email appears in the preview pane. This pane lets us view an email message without having to open it first. If you can't see all the text, use the scroll bar to bring more of it into view. For large amounts of text, there's another way to read your mail in a bigger window. Double-click the message line in the inbox. A separate window containing the email opens on the screen. Click the Maximize button. And our message fills the screen. Although we can only see one message on the screen, we can easily switch between this one and the other open messages. Look at the status bar at the bottom of the screen. This area displays the emails and programs that are currently open. Suzanne has opened a second email, and both of them are shown here. When she clicks on the second email on the status bar, it appears on top of her currently displayed email. This is a quick way to switch between open emails. Go ahead and close your second email, Suzanne. Back at our greeting email from Video Professor, the attached field below the subject line tells us the name and size of the attachment. Close the email message window by clicking the X, and we're back at our original view. Attachments are a great way to exchange files between you and a client a friend, a family member, or anyone you correspond with. However, there is a limitation. In order to open an attached file, the person receiving it must have the software application that created the file. This attachment was created as a text file, so we should be able to open it. Click the paperclip icon, and from the drop-down list, click the attachment name. The attachment opens on our screen. This is a much easier way to send information than having to type out this document. We'll return and learn more about attachments a little later. I want to add a word of caution here. Be careful when opening attachments, especially from people you don't know. They can be used to place viruses or worms on your computer, causing all sorts of problems. If you know the person who sent the attachment, it's probably safe to open, but even that person could be a victim of a virus attack and their email to you was automatically generated by the virus. After reading the opened attachment, click the X to close it. Now that we've opened our email greeting, we have several options for handling it from here. Viewers, you can sit back for a moment and watch while Suzanne goes through some of these options. Clicking the Reply button on the left side of the toolbar opens an email box where we could respond to the person who sent the email. The next button, Reply All, would respond to the sender and to anyone else CC'd on the mail. Clicking the Forward button would let us send this email and the attachment to anyone whose email address we type in the To field. The Print button opens the dialog box that lets us send this email to our printer. And if we want to get rid of this email, we can click the Delete button. For this email, let's do something a little different. Click the X on the message box to return to our inbox. Now that we have read our email greeting from Video Professor, let's move it to our new Video Professor folder. Click that message to highlight it, and while holding down the mouse button, drag it to the personal folder. As the mouse pointer moves into the folder's pane, it turns into an arrow with a box attached. When the personal folder becomes highlighted, release the mouse button. Click the personal folder, and there's our email. Pretty easy, isn't it? Let's go back to the inbox and delete the carbon copy email. Click the inbox, and select the carbon copy email to highlight it. Click the delete button on the same email toolbar, and our email is deleted. Now go back to the folder list and click the deleted items folder. There's our deleted email. This is the last place to find it before it is permanently deleted. Let's delete the message from the computer. 
Click the Email and click the Delete button on the toolbar. Or just press the Delete key on the keyboard. A window opens, asking if we want to permanently delete this message. Click Yes. That's all there is to it. The email is deleted. A quick note, be careful who you send your email address to, as you could start getting junk email, just like you do through your regular mail. We'll talk more about online privacy and avoiding junk email a little later. Accessing your email, even from someone else's computer, is easy. When connected to the Internet, go to the website of your email service. No matter which service you have, there will either be a sign-in box on the home page or a button usually marked Mail or Email to take you to that box. Just type in your screen name and password, click the Sign In button, and you're there! As you begin receiving more email, you may find the ones that are organized and well-written are easier to read. While we're free to be creative in our emails, many people find that concise, clearly written messages are more acceptable for business and professional correspondence. That concludes my first lesson on the Internet. We've learned the fundamentals of the Internet, how to search the web, and how to send and receive email. In my next lesson, we'll learn how to set up personal preferences in Microsoft Explorer, discuss ways to keep our computer and our online privacy protected, look at the world of chat rooms and instant messaging, and discover a powerful way to communicate and share information with others on the Internet. Thank you for being such good students. And remember, there is always more you can learn from me, the Video Professor.